The year is 1989. Part two of the modern Hollywood classic movie, Back to the Future, is playing in cinemas around the world. Boundaries of time and space are broken. Fantasy becomes reality, and reality becomes fantasy. Perhaps many of us experience this most with the flying taxi cab, inspired by the Citroen DS. A real car whose introduction in 1955 made history with its revolutionary futuristic design. San Francisco, the city where the future started, such as we experience in Back to the Future. To be more precise, at ILM, Industrial Light and Magic, also known for movies such as Star Wars, Jurassic Park, and Harry Potter. The future in Back to the Future is designed with precision. Every detail is well thought out. Nothing is coincidental from the button on the dashboard to the actor's costumes. The mastermind behind this is ILM's visual effects art director, John Bell. Uh, these are two shirts from Back to the Future 3. And at the time, I was uh, dating the costume designer, Joanna Johnston, and she made an extra, sh extra Marty McFly atomic shirt because I had designed the symbols for it. So she made a shirt for me of Marty McFly's Western shirt and then Doc Brown's shirt that he wears in Back to the Future 3 also. So it's a nice little perk from, from the film. So I've held on to them. You see John Bell's love for car design once again portrayed in detailed sketches of various types of car which appear in the movie. I'd studied car design at Art Center College in Pasadena, and I was always in drawing, drawing cars and coming up with different designs. And um, so I just started coming up with different shapes for what uh, a flying taxi cab, flying police cars could be in the future. I figured if there were going to be flying cars in the future, there would be government cars, like police cars, firefighting vehicles. Those would be the first things to fly, ambulances, paramedics. And then um, the taxi idea came up that um, I don't even think at first that was supposed to fly, but um, just came up with different shapes. Wasn't anything specific in mind. There was one small profile that I had done and it had a very DS type quality to it, but it, the wheelbase was a little more stretched out. Um, the proportions of the cabin were a little different. And um, I think that's when Mike Chaffee started getting more involved. And uh, he said, you know, this looks a lot like a DS to me. And maybe we could work something around a, a DS. Michael Chaffee, an expert in the area of visual effects art design. After Chaffee designed the legendary kit car, which appeared in the Knight Rider series, designing cars for Back to the Future seemed a logical step to take. As visual effects art director, it is down to him to make the cars of 2015 look realistic and futuristic. Michael Sheffe studied at aircraft school and at the Art Center, both in California. He's been interested in cars from a very early age. When I was a kid, I was lucky enough to go to Europe. My dad had a sabbatical year. And plus, I grew up in a funny little place where people would take sabbaticals and bring back cars with them from Europe. So you saw interesting cars driving around uh, where I lived. And I loved the Citroëns. We had a neighbor who had one, and I would come running outside when this girl's aunt would drive up in that car, and I made them take me in it. One day we went to the dump. They were going to the Berkeley dump, and I said, I've got to have a ride. It was beautiful. It was a white uh, DS. From a white DS in the past 
the journey was made to a flying DS taxi cab in the future. There were some things that were clear in the movie. First of all, cars would fly, so maybe there would be some, uh, s some way to acknowledge the fact that they may need little uh, surfaces to, con like uh, control surfaces on an airplane, maybe a little tail or little winglets, or maybe they don't need that. Maybe uh, the wheels come down and there's some kind of a levitation system. He gave me some, um, some drawings of uh, a Citroen DS First step in making that car a reality was to decide, yeah, we're going to use a Citroen DS. And in order to do that, took pictures of the car, and then laid out the photographs, measured the car, and made a scale drawing of the car, and gave John some of these drawings to use as an underlay, so he could sketch over it to perfectly get the feel of that car transferred onto a, a real Citroën. And I did some overlays on top of that and, and altered it and massaged it to fit into a, a DS chassis, DS proportion. So John did this beautiful sketch, which uses that same perspective so the builders can see, oh, right, we change this, we change that, and we make this roof, and we add these parts, and so forth. You know, in America we have checker cabs, and it's a real traditional um, graphic motif on cabs. So I thought, well, let's just modify that and, and represent it in the future. You know, it was such an icon that once you saw that checkerboard pattern, people identify, okay, it's definitely a taxi cab. It's yellow, it's got the checkerboards. It just set it instantly. And I remember seeing, um, from uh, 1970s 928 Porsches. I think they offered a, a, um, an option where they had a, a distorted checkerboard pattern in the seats. And I remember how great the lines were and how organic they were. And so I thought, oh, I'm just gonna take that idea and work that into our checkerboard motif and see what it looks like. When it comes to making the seats, though, the checkerboard, he didn't want to see just a regular square pattern. He wanted it to be big and small, big and small like this, kind of like that 60s op art. And in order to make that fabric, every piece had to be specially cut, sewn together, then the whole thing pieced together. The collaboration between John Bell and Michael Sheffe was very inspiring. With great respect for each other's talent and vision, together they fine-tuned every detail, idea, and development. He would come in to make sure we had the checker pattern just right. He made sure that we had the correct yellow for the for the overall paint scheme just right and the roof details. He wanted to add more of an 80s, uh, like a uh, like a, a splatter paint job, which is really subtle, but it's in the it's in the um, the dashboard of the of the DS. So he'd come in and ask me if that fit into the overall vision of the car. He was very good, very responsible with doing that, and it was great. It was a wonderful collaboration. I would draw a lot of details after talking to John, but before I ever took a drawing to the shop, I'd show John the sketch, and I'd say, look, is this what you have in mind? He'd say, not really, or yeah, exactly, or I hadn't thought of that, but it seems okay, whatever. And then I'd I'd make it so he liked it, you know? I had to ask him for a lot of details, but it's his car. I wanted it to really look like he wanted it to look. loved these big taillights that John had drawn below the roof. The Citroen has a light up here, but you wouldn't see it with this big thing on it. So we used taillights from a 59 Cadillac, and they look so perfect with the rest of the car, kind of streamlined and lumpy all at the same time. The 
tail lights, they took an awful lot of work. They're made out of a vacuum formed plastic. So in order to build something like this, you've got to first have a mold and then you heat a sheet of plastic in a special machine. You suck it down over the mold using a vacuum. You let air pressure form it. And it took a certain amount of work to get them to look just right. I wanted them to look really nice, like parts that came from the factory. The idea on these graphs is, as, a, as a, a value gets bigger, the lit area also gets bigger, and you would, in theory, have needles pointing to it. We didn't expect to be so close on the interior we would see a moving needle, but we did expect to be close enough that this light would be really nice to have, and the lights on the dash, too. Even the smallest things on this car took an awful lot of work. This is all done before computers. In order to get this typeface, which didn't exist at the time, I had to draw it. I drew it in pen on an original, maybe this big. We shot it with a special graphic arts camera. And from that, we get a negative. It's a film negative. From the negative, we make a positive. In this case, the positive is a rub down transfer. So you take the transfer, and you rub it down onto the window. It's actually got a little glue on it, so you just press it into place. Well, every bit of signage on the taxi had to be done that way. When I'd done the initial concept sketches for the car, I was always putting characters or some occasionally I'd doodle up in the corner. Here's this picture of this great guy up in the corner, and he wrote, your driver, Serge. You know, Serge has a double meaning in, uh, in uh, the U.S., you know, it could be somebody's name, short, short for Sergio, or it could mean that you're surging, you're, you're lurching, you're um, thrusting forward. So you have this idea of this plushly upholstered Citroen taxi with the soft suspension kind of surging along, flying through the air. Well, we thought that was kind of funny. But when the time came for uh, there's a meter in the back of the cab. The rate meter has a picture of the driver. And on the rate meter, it says, your driver. Now it says Bernie, because in the script, his name is Bernie. This is a picture they took in a photo shoot of the actual actor who was the driver. And Costume had to go make his outfit before the pictures were taken. It's a transparency. And behind this is a little light. So in the old days, when they, they used this, the light would come on. It says, your driver, Bernie, here. That'll be 174.50. Here. I'd be careful, old timer. There's a rough neighbor's seat. Right here, here it is. In the future, there's this idea that cars can fly. And at the end of part one, you see the wheels of the DeLorean come down as if there's some kind of lifting mechanism there, some sort of force. So they're calling that maglev for magnetic levitation. There's maglev trains were being developed where uh, trains are floating on a, a thin cushion of magnetic resistance. And so that idea was employed for the hoverboards. So we thought, well, it's going to be throughout the society, it'll be in automobiles as well. You can imagine ILM constructed a miniature flying taxi cab, so with the use of special effects, it was able to fly. ILM built a beautiful model. It was a good sized model. And I made some sketches, talked to John about how he'd like to see the wheels deploy, and we suggested that maybe the rear wheels are actually on a system which is a little like the suspension system that exists in the car, where it comes down, the wheels come out and fold down and so forth. This is the beginning of a little series of sketches I did for the model shop. They asked, how is it really going to look when the wheels come down for hover flight? So this is the picture in stock street configuration. Here's the second in that series. The rear trailing arms drop down, and that allows some clearance for the back wheels here to do a little bit of a turn. And here they are flipping down into a position where they're parallel to the trailing arms. Here's the last picture in the sequence. 
In this one, the trailing arms are back up into their normal position. The wheels are flipped down and back, and the front wheels flip down as well. And that gives it the ability to fly because these things are now in a position to reflect gravity or whatever it is that they do. In the movie, when you see a car fly, there are two possible things happening. If it's a close shot and it's a real car, it's being lifted off camera by a materials handler, like a big forklift truck. If you see the car flying and it's clear of the ground, and you see the whole thing, that's a miniature. And anytime you see the wheels folding down, any of that stuff, it's a miniature. On taxi cabs in the U.S., the taxi driver has to have a, a certificate to drive his cab to operate it. And so we need signatures on that, on that certificate. So Michael came up with the idea where he was going to sign his name, I was going to sign my name, and it became the cab driver's certificate in the movie. Here's a little certificate that gives this taxi one year, from 2015 to 2016, to be operated in inner-city hover flight. And if you look here carefully, you'll see there's John Bell's signature. We're the inspectors. And there's my signature. Uh, I think the DS owners, um, I think they only swore because their car didn't fly and ours did. I think for as, as pure as the DS owners want to keep their cars, I think to a degree, to see their car being used in a film, in a major film like that, was probably a, a nice thing for them. I can only suppose that they went, wow, they chose a DS, that's cool, yeah. All the way along when you're building something, you see it step by step. At first you think, this, this is much more than I bargained for. And then you see it take shape and it comes together. And when that thing is done and you've done it on schedule and it turns out like you imagined, it's a wonderful feeling. I'm so lucky to have been part of that. It's an incredible feeling. And John would come and visit, and he was delighted with it too. And that's really the most important thing to me. Twenty years after the premiere of Back to the Future Part Two, the flying taxi cab is still very much an object of curiosity. Just like its introduction in 1955, the car is both revolutionary and futuristic. <laughs>